right on time. <coughs> Some thought this was at 7 o'clock tonight, but it's not true, it's 3. <laughs> so uh, let's start with our usual 30 seconds of uh, quiet time between us and the Lord to make sure we're in fellowship, to deal with anything um, in fellowship, pray for concentration. In 30 seconds of quiet, after quiet time, I'll start with prayer. Dearest Heavenly Father, <clears throat> Lord, I pray for your blessing on this time that we're together in your word. Help us to uh, put everything aside for the time being just to be with you, to be with your truth and your Holy Spirit, who is the true teacher of the word of God. I uh, pray, Lord, that we will take these doctrines not just as something in the future, but, Lord, uh, to apply them to our life, to apply them to what we see, and to use them in the wisdom that you give us not just for spiritual maturity, but also for the spiritual combat that we are involved in. I ask this in Jesus' holy and perfect name. Amen. So, <clears throat> today is May the 9th, Sunday. We are in Revelation. Actually, we're just leaving Revelation. This is um, the summary part uh, we're going to do tonight. And um, we have a bit of discussion, as we always do. But um, hopefully this big mess here, you can see this. Um, I'm going to do something a little different tonight. And uh, I'm actually probably going to read one verse. I'm going to read the verses of 17, of course. But one verse here. But I have a lot of other verses on here. And I'm hoping you can see them. <clears throat> because your assignment this week, since so many people like Bible study, they spend more time in Bible study than they actually do in Bible study. <laughs> Meaning that they read their Bible, as we've talked about. Nothing wrong with the word... Reading of the Word of God, it is a way of reinforcing things you already know. <clears throat> but you will not learn new things from them because of the way that the Lord has uh, set up the protocol for the church age, which is actually in this verse here we'll talk about. So I wanted to just touch bases of, of why we're in such an important place. Um, humanists <clears throat> uh, in the church uh, have indoctrinated via religion, are in reality traitors to God and to Christ and to the Word of God. Okay, I want to read that again. Humanists who have brought humanism into the church, as we've been talking about this, we've talked about many examples of this, um, have in, re in reality, they are the traitors. They have taken uh, hu humanist ideas and they have replaced the plan of God and the doctrine of God in churches, which is why we are in the mess we are in today. It is pervasive, which is why the church is being disciplined, as well as the country, as the resulting degeneracy that comes when the light of the Lord's people becomes dim and small. Darkness prevails. So we're going to read this piece right here, <coughs> which is Ephesians <coughs> excuse me, 4.11. And... 11 isn't really what I wanted to do, actually, with the jump to 12, but 11 is kind of the basis of 12, 13, and 14. And it also told, tells us some very important doctrine here. So in Ephesians 4, 11, it says, uh, It was he who gave some apostles, and it, the he here is the Holy Spirit. We know that it's the Holy Spirit who provides the gifts, of, of uh, the spiritual gifts, to the believer at the moment he is saved. Okay, And what happens is many people don't know their gifts because they never mature. In reality, maturity will make those gifts just flourish on their own. And uh, contrary to uh, most people's thinking, because they haven't been uh, really tutored or, or uh, shown what gifts are, is those gifts come in many, many um, uh, forms that are not even listed in the Word of God, yet God uses them very similar to where he uses a football on a team, is that everybody has its role. And I'm going to read the, the, the list here. He says, It is he who gave some to be apostles, 
some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. And I'm going to stop there uh, to let you know that whatever a person's role is, it is their role. Um, their role meaning that they are not better, they are not smarter, they are not nicer people, they are not more gifted. What they are is they have been given a gift by the Holy Spirit that allows them to perform their duty. Many people take pastors and teachers and rise them up to a place that somehow they are better than other Christians. They are absolutely not. That is, that is anti-biblical. In reality, they have a different role, very similar to mothers and fathers. Happy Mother's Day, by the way. <laughs> That's my, other than the mother who's the prostitute, we won't be talking about mothers today. Um, but the, the point is that uh, mothers and fathers have different roles. Um, they are equal in God's view. Men and women are absolutely equal in opportunity from God's point of view. That's very clear. There are no men, there are no women, right? We know that scripture. And what it tells us is that, in reality, they have equal opportunity. What they have is different roles. Okay, and those roles are very specific in the scriptures. Just like pastors have a very specific roles, evangelists have a very specific roles, and teachers have a very specific role. In reality, there are other scriptures that just list many other gifts that believers have. Gifts of helps, uh, gifts of encouragement, um, many, many gifts, a missionary uh, type things. But these are gifts from God that are given at the moment of salvation. Uh, and there are many, many, many of them. The problem is that they don't become uh, operational. They don't become operational until you have reached the maturity of where you do not make them disastrous. Now, one of the problems with uh, pastors and teachers many times, and sometimes evangelists, is that they actually start using their gift before they have actually become mature. And that is some of the reason we have the mess we have today, is reality is that they do not properly use the Word of God. They are not good workmen of the Word of God, as the Scripture says. So in verse 12, this is what we do here. Uh, it says, to, be, to prepare God's people for works of service. That is the purpose of a pastor and a teacher. That's what they do. That was the purpose of the apostles when the apostles were actually an active gift. And it has not been an active gift for a almost 2,000 years. He says, though, that the body of Christ, that's all Christians, that's all, that's church universal, uh, those who are saved, okay, uh, may be built up. Built up for what? Spiritual maturity, spiritual combat. And it says that right here. Until we all reach the unity of the faith. Now, hopefully you know what unity of the faith is. This is there's a, a guy I really like, uh, his name's R.B. Theme Jr., who talks about uh, an EDC, an edification complex. But we've actually learned this in a different sense when we covered Philippians not that long ago. It is that collection of Bible doctrine that you have, that you put together, that becomes the working, uh, the, the, the working structure and protocol of your spiritual life. Okay, so that's what that is. That's kind of the, the package of maturity that you have been given. Okay, uh, and then it says here, and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. See, that's an objective. And become knowledge of God here is that you take, the, you take Bible doctrine, that's the unity of the faith, you put it together. The piece that's the knowledge of the Son of God is epinosis. That means that it's the spiritual knowledge that you possess in your soul. If you do not possess that because you accept it as true, you just have gnosis, which is academic knowledge. You don't have anything you can use. As a Christian, you can only use what you know and what you believe to be true. One of the problems many Christians have. And then it says, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of fullness of Christ. What is that? That's that maturity we talked about in Philippians. So this is the goal. Pastors and teachers, their goal and their objective is to give knowledge of the Word of God so that people have the full knowledge of Epinosis doctrine of the Son of God so that they may be mature and become more Christ-like. Okay, so now we have established from the Scriptures, from Ephesians, there's much more here, that this is the objective of pastors and teachers. It's not to evangelize. In reality, we leave that to evangelists. 
A pastor can evangelize. They, they, they most of the time know enough to do that. Um, one of the problems we have in churches many times is that evangelists have become uh, pastors. And the problem with that is they evangelize their their um, congregation over and over again. Every single message is an evangelist message. This is not uncommon. Many of us have come up in churches like that. But in reality, their gift is not pastor or teacher. Their, their gift is evangelism. And believe it or not, evangelism does not belong in the church. It actually belongs outside the church. You know why? Because that's where, um, that's where unbelievers are at. They're on the outside. They visit once in a while. But in reality, uh, evangelists belong on the outside of the church, evangelizing people. That is also given to us as a great honor of all believers to be able to evangelize in, the, in that personal place where the Holy Spirit puts you, where you have that opportunity. So let's move on from there. But you now know the objective, you know the purpose of our class, of this class, is always to do that. So whenever you wonder why we keep banging on Bible doctrine and spiritual maturity and understanding where revelation fits and why it's important, you will understand that this is the objective right there. One sentence. That's the objective. Um, and why is that? I'm going to read 14 because that's where most of the church is at. He says, Then we will no longer be infants. They talk about infants, spiritually infants, uh, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. That means false doctrine. Every little thing, oh, I heard something new. Oh, I want to be an evangelist. Oh, I want to be a missionary. I'm having some fun here. But you get the idea. Because all of a sudden, oh, I've gotten the light and off I go. Okay? That's this thing right here. What, if you look at people who do that, they are the description here. They are infants. They are spiritual babies. And that's why they don't have the ability to discern the Word of God and go through it and say, is this what God would have me do? Would God have me abandon my husband and my wife and my children? Am I going to drag all of them for this whim, for this part here? It's talking about here, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every whim of teaching. That's not Christianity. Well, it is Christianity, but it's not supposed to be. God is not fickled. God is not unstable. And the way that you see a stable believer is one who is stable like the one before. They have knowledge. They know what they're here for. They know what their job is. Their job is to be, and I'll just tell you your mission so that you don't have to guess about it. In reality, every single believer is a full-time Christian service. Okay? All day long. You are the best husband you are as, as a witness to what Christ has changed in your life. You are the best mother, the best wife, and you do all that you do for the Lord Jesus Christ because that is your witnessing field. If you work, that is your witnessing field. Now, I'm not telling you to go evangelize everybody because you may get fired. In reality, what I'm telling you is to go work. That's right, go work. Do the very best job you can at your work. Be the very best in attitude and, and, and the commission of your job to be like Jesus Christ as his commission was given by God the Father. I don't, I don't do what I want to do. I do what I'm told to do, okay? That's what that is. In reality, as parents, we are to be the very best witnesses, not just in our words because they are short and small, but in every action of our attitude, every action of our behavior, and all that we are. That's the mission field for us. That's where God has put us. And we'll cover that in a little bit. Um, so this piece here says, every, um, so that we're not blown around by the wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Now, this is talking about not just the world, but also talking about the church. In reality, if you remember, the Judaizers were here, and they did a lot of things in the church, and they were swaying people to do weird things. And what Paul was trying to tell them over and over again is that the Word of God is your foundation, which is why we, we say this over and over and over again, so that you will not be moved around. So you will not become part of the chaff. So let's go to our uh, Revelation as I've seen, why is Revelation important? And, and what, what I've come to, if you watch this whole thing in the summary, 
hopefully you'll, you'll get it. In reality, revelation is to make us aware, to beware, Christian, of the active sub, of seduction of ecumenical religion, of religion of Satan in the church and in our lives and in the world. It is the most cunning thing that there has. Like I said last week, in reality, the best thing that Satan ever came up with to divert the church and dilute its purpose is religion, is to bring in legalism, is to switch things like um, uh, Bible doctrine being the most biggest purpose, as to most churches the biggest purpose is bring more people in and evangelize them. And my, th my, and my opinion of that is that let's bring all these babies in so that we have as many idiot Christians as is possible. Okay, And what I mean by that is that when people become saved, the only thing that has changed in their mind at the moment of salvation is that Jesus is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord and our Savior. Every other part of their mentality is still unbeliever. Okay, They haven't been indoctrinated. They haven't been transformed by the renewing of their mind, as Romans 12 2 tells us. So, um, the important part we have here, why revelation? Why revelation is to make us aware as Christians that there is an active, powerful uh, agent going on right now in the world every day of our lives to convert the world and keep it in the, in the, in the cosmic doctrine of Satan, but also to infiltrate the church so that the word of God is, is milked down, is replaced. And we've talked about that, okay? Um, that was a lesson of like a week ago. So let's go into this here. What I did is I kind of put this as a uh, piece here, and I have lots of verses here, um, here and here and here and here and here, and I have lots of them, and we'll, and we'll cover some of these. But I want to go through this as a, kind of a collage, okay? So I'm going to go through each verse, but I'm going to just talk about what it is. And I put it up here so you can kind of follow it. And then we'll, we'll but the, the problem is that there's actually much more details in the verse than I can possibly do. I'm going to move over here where I can, there we go, I think that's the right spot. Where then I can actually do, and uh, it, you know me, right? This would take four more classes. So I want to wrap it up so we can get into 18 and talk about it a little bit. So I'm going to read the verses and, and we're going to kind of go through this summary collage of things. He says, this is Revelation 17 verse 1. It says, one of the seventh, seventh angels who had the seventh bowl, so remember that, the bowl judgments that were before, one of the angels that was the, uh, I've used the word poor suivant, okay, that means he was a, a higher echelon, uh, it comes from the herald, um, herald uh, uh, heraldry that's used in Europe, but it means that he's an upper position uh, angel relative to the other. In fact, he's a very powerful and important angel. We'll actually run into another great angel in, in uh, verse 18, chapter 1. We'll talk about angelology and where they fit. But it says, the seventh bowl. So we know he came from the seventh bowl. And he said to me, uh, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute. And we know that um, this is, he's going to offer him Bible doctrine, John, and he's going to tutor him. So the, the army uh, angel has become a teaching angel, which is not un uncommon. And it actually is very consistent with God's plan. And we see it all the time. Um, but the punishment of the great prostitute isn't a, uh, a woman in reality or a prostitute. Uh, she is in reality, this is a, an analogy that God has given to us by explanation that she is ecumenical religion of this time. And we've put a list of it right here. Um, and this is where she fits right here. She's the mother of all these religions. When, when, when great, if you can see what's happened here, is that whenever religion becomes engulfed in a great empire, what happens is she rules the world. Okay, she rules everything. Okay, and that's what we'll have in the tribulation. Okay, but what happens is she is the mother. She's called the mother of prostitutes, uh, as we have up here. And I've, I've, I've actually put that down here so you can see it. She is the mother of all these great, and this is the seven heads that we talked about, understanding that these seven heads, in reality, are religious empires that were joined with the world empires, uh, at least as they, the world empires actually started here in the third one. This is the first beast that Daniel saw. But they're actually here too because this is 
uh, Israel-centric, right? This is from Israel's point of view. Uh, the scriptures are written that way, uh, especially from Daniel's point of view. Um, so we have here that she is the mother. What does that mean? She is the mother, on Mother's Day, of course, of all the prostitute religions that have come from her. And here are the listing of these seven major prostitutes, as we've talked about. Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Chaldean, Medo-Persian, uh, Greco-Macedonian, uh, the Roman Empire, which is one, much of this is based on, because that's when John wrote it in 96. Today, we're actually in a gap between those two. Okay? Um, and I'll, I'll just talk about the gap because that's where we're at. In time, we're in the gap. Okay? We're in the gap between a, a great, uh, powerful religion, that's uh, the devil's ace trump, the way in which he has the greatest influence is wrapping it up with the power of an empire, okay, like he does in the future with the revived Roman Empire and the Antichrist. That's that wrap-up. But we're in between those, but what we can see is that we can see what we've been talking about here. We can see religion. We can see with our eyes all the religions that are now kind of dispersed all over the place, kind of a uh, many, many flavors of religion that, that kind of touches every piece of us. Um, and what you see now is that you see Satan going for a pulling us all together. Okay, very similar to what's going to happen. What is that called? You see it show up in the coexist. Okay, what is the coexist? We know something, we're all the same, we all have the same God, we really, we're all really kind of good people, we don't do bad things, unless you happen to be a terrorist. Okay, or others, or it happened to be a Hindu uh, during the, right after the war when uh, they were involved, the Hindus and the Muslims were involved in massive murders in, in, uh, in, in India. But let's not talk about that. Or the church being involved in, in uh, when it was out of Spain back in the 1400s. But we're not talking about that. <laughs> we're talking about this one here. But we see this same, we see this same prostitute. We see this same whore. And she influences all these other ones which come to us in the coexist. In that we have religions that are just cover every flavor that's possible. Well, all those other flavors in reality are demonic by the definition of the Word of God. How do we know that? It's because it says very straightforward that there's one name and one name only by which you may be saved. One. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. No other name. Can you be saved by? Which tells us that, and this was one of the litmus tests of the early church, is that when they said that the Lord Jesus was the Savior, and He was He was in the flesh, and He was He was He was died on the cross as the Savior for us, and He came back to life uh, in resurrection. When they say those pieces, in reality, that is the identifying factor that that's true Christianity. Everything else is a lie. Okay? That's the scriptural point of view. That's the New Testament point of view. So we have this thing, so we can see as we look around us, is that this sameness is not the sameness. In reality, what happens, the sameness that it talks about for coexist has to exclude Jesus Christ. That's called being narrow. In fact, some people might even call it hate speech today. And they want to unify us together in reality to push God out. Okay? The one true God. We are in that spot we can see this, this is why Revelation is written to us, is that we can see as the church goes through its time uh, before the rapture, in reality, we can see this great prostitute. We're supposed to be able to see it so that we keep that lie, that religion, out of the church. Now the church has not succeeded in that, and every time it hasn't succeeded, it has been disciplined. Countries have fallen. Uh, churches have been wiped out. Like, the example would be there are the seven churches that are written about in the first two chapters don't exist anymore. And if you remember the penalty for that was that they got that the Lord would take away their lampstand. Or their lampstand is gone. It hasn't been there for thousands of years. Okay? Why? Because they allowed religion to come into the church. The book of Timothy, First and Second Timothy, is written to the instruction of Timothy, the, the goofy Timothy who allowed all this stuff to come into the book of in, into the church of Ephesus. He is chastised over and over by Paul in First Timothy for allowing all this disruption. That he allowed 
religion to infiltrate the church. Okay? So that's what it's for for us to, it is to help us to unify doctrine so that that is our purpose as believers to unify that in a mature way in order to live our lives as Christians and to become the ultimate Christ-likeness, okay? The Shekinah glory going through us, Christ in us, okay? Uh, so hopefully that's not too many words, but that's the direction it's going into. So, the great, uh, who, the great prostitute who sits upon the many waters, as we know, the waters are the people of society. Um, verse 2, and, and with her, the kings of the earth committed her adultery. Now, this is not uh, sexual adultery, this is spiritual adultery. This is by, uh, in reality, bringing religion into being the persuasive factor in uh, with, in with the kings. They, they unite. Okay, and whenever, whenever you see, contrary to, to many Christians' belief, whenever you see religion unite with a church, you, it's going to be disastrous. The only exception to that is Israel, when God set it up that way, and to the millennium, when Christ himself is the ruler of that. He says, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with wine and her adulteries. And I have a, a piece over here, the intoxication piece of it, is when you actually, you become, you become mentally distorted. What does intoxication do? It mentally distorts you. It, 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 you. You have the ability to give false doctrines, to have emotions rule. This is what we have going on in the church today, is because people in reality are intoxicated by religious uh, doctrines. It has crept into and replaced the doctrines of the Word of God. And it, is, it has given us false doctrines. It's given us emotionalism. It is, easily, it, is, it is easily convinced and easily deceived. And that is done by the great deceiver. And we know who that is right here. There's actually an analogy in, in Proverbs 7, those verses I've got that you can actually read the whole chapter, where it talks about how um, with a prostitute or with an adulterous woman... And this is talking about the real adulteress and the real prostitute. But the relationship here is the analogy is the same. Is that it says to the person who says, do not look into her eyes. Do not listen to her voice. Because she will, she will treat you like a slice of bread. In reality, you're a commodity to her. She just wants you, she wants to exchange, in this case, sex for money. But in reality, there's not much different in what's going on here. Uh, in, in, as the prostitute, which is why the Lord uses it. In reality, religion uses people up. It uses them, it takes what they can from them, it gets its power, its glory, its wealth, its glamour, and all of its approbation, all of its worship, from the people, from the, uh, from the waters, if you, if you remember that piece there. Where did I put that at? It's up here somewhere. Verse 3, it says, Then the angels carried me away in the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness. This is the wilderness is the really word for a desolate place, which is talking about where religion's at. There I saw a woman, there she is, right? Sitting, sitting is always a picture of domination, on a scarlet beast. Why a scarlet beast? Because the context of scarlet is the political side of the Roman Empire. That was their color. If you've ever seen anything in Romans, they're little bands, they're all red. They have scarlet in them. Okay, so the reference here is that that, that is a reference at the time John's writing to the Roman Empire that will be reincarnated in reality, will come back, will be revived, as we know, we've talked about it, into the revived Roman Empire, who is the beast to come. Okay? Uh, it was covered with blasphemous names. Uh, I was going to give that a shot, but I'm going to leave it alone. And had seven heads, and those are, the, those are the religious ones we had here, and ten horns. This is the piece that points us to the revived Roman Empire of, that, that matches the, the ancient one. But it will be ten countries, that's the horns, powers, that will be uh, part of what used to be the Roman Empire. It, is the, it will be revived. So it's giving us the setting, too. Verse 4, the woman was dressed in purple, as we talked about that. So that's a regal religious color. And scarlet, she will wear both of them. This is the union we talked about. And was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. 
She will be extremely wealthy. She will have a very high position. The fact that we as Christians many times in this country accept that as a sign of something that's important in reality means that we too have accepted the world's values. Okay? And that's what she's going for. Okay? Um, she, she held a golden cup in her hand. And we know that cup because this is the cup that shows up in the doctrine of demons. This is the filth that shows up. And it says, filled with abom abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This is the doctrine of demons we talked about. In fact, it's actually right here. This is one of the references to it. There's another one in, Second Tim uh, in 1 Corinthians 10. But they're there, and this is the part that talks about all the filth of religion. Now, this is a God point of view. Why is it called filth? Because it is anti-God. It is a shame to him. It is a desecration to him. But in reality, what it is, from the world's point of view, it is the part that looks like, isn't that so beautiful? Look how ritualistic at that. Oh, I love it when they speak in Latin. That's just so holy language. Um, in reality, that's garbage from the God, God's point of view, which is why he calls it filthy. And there are many, many other things that are in those filthy categories in that cup. We've talked about them. Verse 5, uh, the name written on her forehead, and we talked about the forehead, that means that she's a prostitute. That's what she has this written in the analogy, was a mystery. And this mystery is the part that is unknown, but will be revealed and is revealed. <clears throat> Babylon the Great, and this is a reference to ancient Babylon, um, the one that came out of um, uh, ancient um, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, Nimrod, who came out of Nimrod and is referenced in Isaiah and other places we've talked about that. And she is the mother of prostitute. How is she the mother of prostitute? She has produced these major uh, religions. The Egyptians were full of gods that were also completely held by the, by the government itself, by the political side. Um, the Assyrians had the same thing. The Babylonians, these, this is the, the mother of prostitutes talking about these prostitute religions. This is a biblical divine viewpoint. And the abominations of the earth, what does that mean? In reality, it means that all of these things that the earth has have kept millions of people from God and have made them, made them do many, many horrible things. In reality, all of them anti-God. The things that you see in our country that are so... Uh, anti-God and anti-doctrine and anti-thing. Those are the things it's talking about. That's the abominations of the earth. From the viewpoint of God as he put the earth together and his plan, it is the part that has pulled it apart. Uh, we will find that these abominations never work. They always destroy. Uh, an example is anybody who thinks of getting rid of policemen and thinks that the world's going to get better is absolutely nuts. Okay? And most of us knew that because in reality, evil will prevail. Okay? And that's what happens. Uh, verse 6, I saw a woman was drunk in the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those um, who bore a testimony to Jesus. This is talking specifically about tribulational saints. Although this religion, this ecumenical religion, has drank the blood of saints forever. Okay? And it's right here. She is drunk. She is drunk on the blood of believers. And if I had to give a picture of this, what I would say is that the, the, the analogy should show this prostitute, this great prostitute, with blood on her mouth of the blood of the saints, of, of the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what it should show her is that that little cup that she's drinking to get drunk should be just horrible. Um, in reality it is. He says, the blood of those who bore testimony. And he says, when I saw her, I was greatly astonished. John was shocked. How is this possible? How is it possible that this, that this uh, pr great prostitute, the mother of prostitutes, can be just dripping in blood of the saints? And the angel, verse 7, tells us, why, why would you be astonished? Do you think that evil has a depth? Do you, you think there's something that evil won't do? No, it's not that way. Evil will do anything. The most horrible things you can think of. And we've heard those. The phallic cult. The, the burning of babies. It, it, it will do all of that. 
And I'm sure that you can that you're that you're rolling over in your mind right now thinking about the things in this country, in this country, the United States of America, that was based on biblical grounds, is now doing some of these horrific things by the millions. It's, they're everywhere. Okay? So that's why the angel's saying, Why are you astonished? Okay, why are you shocked? That's what he says. Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides and the seven heads and the ten horns. And we've talked about those. He says, the beast you saw, he's an explanation of the beast, the beast you saw, uh, um, you saw, back when he's talking about it, was, uh, once was, now is not, and yet is, in, and yet is still to come. And he's talking about, in reality, he's talking about here, you know, it was, it is, and it is to come, okay? So that's that piece there. He's talking about the beast and the Roman Empire and the split that we have here. The beast that was before was the one he saw was in 96 AD. It once was, now is not. That's talking about the end of the empire in 476, Roman Empire. Even today, now is not, okay? And yet will come in the future. Uh, it says we'll come out of the abyss. We talked about that with respect to Abaddon. Um, the, the, um, the king of the underworld, uh, the inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast. This is talking about unbelievers. That is a, a, a statement that identifies unbelievers. Their name is not written in the, work, in the book of life. Um, it says, because it was, it is, it now, now is not, and is yet to come. Still talking about it, the identification of the beast. So we know this is the beast of the future, the Antichrist. Verse 9. This calls for a mind of wisdom. Wisdom, okay? The part that we talked about, wisdom, is up here. This is what it takes. It takes Bible doctrine. It says, so he's amazed. Why is he amazed? The mystery is a mystery to him. He doesn't understand the depth of the depravity. And he says, Bible doctrine is required. Wisdom, Proverbs 8.1 6 through 14 talks about the wisdom of God. Why is it important? Because in reality, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, there's one that's called the soulish man. Okay? The soulless man is the natural man. He is the unbeliever. He cannot understand the word of God. It is foolishness to him. Okay? So it's saying we need to be verse 15. It's a contrasting verse. The spiritual man in the scripture called pneumatikos. Pneumatikos. And what it means is that in order to understand this, the angel tells us, you're going to have to be mature. You're going to have to be the spiritual man. Okay? And there's one more man that's not mentioned in this piece, but it's talking about. And the problem is the church today is the fleshly man. Okay? It's in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3. He says it's the fleshly man. It is a man who is saved, but he lives by his flesh. Okay? Um, in reality, uh, uh, this is called the Sarkikos man, okay? But these are the three, and it's saying the only one that will be understanding here will understand. It requires somebody to be the spiritual man. That's why Bible doctrine is so important. Um, and it says that, she, that, that the seven heads are the seven mountains, mountains meaning the empires, uh, on which she sits, it means that she dominates those empires. Uh, there are also the seven kingdoms, kings here, kingdoms, five have fallen, okay? Let's talk about these first five here. One through five have fallen. One is, that's the one he's in, Roman Empire, okay? And the other has not yet come. That's the one in our future too that happens in the tribulation. But when he comes, he will remain for a little while. And the little while is one piece in the scripture calls that we'll run into it. Calls it an hour. So all of these are going to get together in reality, unite the world into one religion to both persecute and kill the saints in order to fight the Lord Jesus Christ in the battle of Armageddon and the greatest world battle. We've talked about that. And we'll touch it again in 19 because that's where it comes up. And yet they will spend one hour from a cosmic point, a very small, small period of time and yet, they will lose everything. They will spend eternity in the lake of fire for doing that. And it says that here. He says, he belongs to the seventh, meaning the seventh one down here, the seventh head, uh, and is going to his destruction 
And that's the part in the lake of fire in chapter 19. We'll get there. <clears throat> so it says here, the ten horns uh, you saw are the ten kings. This is talking about the ten kings of the revived Roman Empire who have not yet received a kingdom. That means that they're not kings yet. That's in the future for John and even for us. But for one hour, we'll receive authority as kings for a very short period of time. We know that one hour is three and a half years or 42 months, along with the beast, the Antichrist. Verse 17, I mean verse 13, it says, They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. There is a collaboration of these ten kings in the revived Roman Empire where they will collaborate. Their whole purpose to receive that power will be to give that power to the beast so that they can dominate the entire world. Okay? Uh, and that's how they bring it about. Verse 14. They will wage war against the land. This is the part we're talking about. In reality, not. this is a real war. This is a real war where they gather together in the, in the valley of Megiddo, called the Armageddon, and they will, their attempt will be to gather all the armies of the entire world. Like I said, we'll cover this in chapter 19, at, towards the end of that. Um, we've covered a little bit of it to actually to wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them. We're getting a foresight of prophecy. The Lord's telling us, don't worry about it. I've got this covered. Uh, because the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, mean the Lord Jesus Christ, and with Him, um, those who are called with Him. That's us, okay? Uh, all believers will be called with Him, some mature, some not. Uh, verse 15, And the angel said to me, the waters, the waters you saw, this is an explanation of the waters, you saw where the prostitute sits are the people, the multitudes, that's cultures, languages, and nations. And it means that she dominates this religion, this, this, the whore of Babylon, in reality dominates the people of the, of the world, and in reality at this time, still has a great dominating effect today, but she will unify them and languages and barriers of nationality and all the other things will not stop her from that. In reality, it will be used as a tool to help that deception and help bring, her, bring them all under her where she dominates them. 16. The beast and the ten horns um, that you saw will hate the prostitute. Now we see the change. Okay, what happens that before they were just thinking love each other, a marriage made in hell. <laughs> okay, yeah. and they're all lovey dovey, and they just share this thing. But what's happening now? We know this piece. It says the beast and the ten horns uh, you saw will hate the prostitute, and they will bring her to ruin, leave her naked, which means that they will they will strip her of all of her power and her glamour. This will all be gone. She will, they will strip them. Why would they do that? Because we know from Daniel, which we read before, a 9.27, that what will happen here is that the, the, the Satan and the Antichrist will no longer be happy with all the religions indirectly worshipping him because we know that, demon, that demons are behind the idols and behind every demon is Satan himself, that that indirect religion will, will not be allowed because now he wants all of it for him. He wants it all. The Antichrist is, in reality, his man for the earth. And he is the dragon who will be worshipped. And the world, those people who hold on to their religions, in reality, will be wiped out will be killed and murdered and sacrificed, very similar to what we see him doing prior to that with the, with the believers, the blood of the saints that we talked about earlier. He will extend that out, and those who do not make the transition from ecumenical religion to direct, to direct worship of Satan and the Antichrist will be executed. That's what that's saying here. They will be eaten. It says, they will, meaning the kings and the beast, will eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. And the burning with fire we talked about has to do with the ecumenical headquarters, which most people will believe is in Rome because of the fact that the, the Antichrist has picked the Roman Empire as his, um, as his uh, common wealth, wealth of power and political power and ecumenical power, meaning in, in, uh, in the church. So this is the part where we'll be, will be burned, and we'll talk about that in detail in 18, because that's where it comes up. 
17, uh, for, for God has put it in their hearts to accomplish his purpose. This is, a, this is great. Um, meaning that it may look like evil has its own brain and it knows what it's doing, but in reality, God reaches in and controls them by withdrawing his, his power of restraint and allows evil to have its full spot, its full place. Um, there is no depth of evil and atrocities that evil will not do. There is nothing it will not betray. There is nothing it will do. You see this in things like in terrorism nowadays. You see it do things that are, that are just atrocities that are hard to believe, like the shock of John, okay? But in reality, the Lord will allow this evil here, this, um, no, not him, not him, this great evil here to become so powerful, it will destroy the former lover, okay? In reality, why? It's because now the lover is in the way, okay? It doesn't, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna love and worship her, you're gonna love and worship me, okay? And this is how it does that. It destroys it, even destroys its converts who once were the worshipers uh, of, uh, of ecumenical religion and Satan behind that, but now it will be direct. And it says here, for his purpose, God does this, God is always in control of history. Jesus Christ controls history. It says, by agreeing to hand over the beast, uh, over to the beast, their royal authority. This is the consummation of the beast and the power until God's words are fulfilled, which means the end. And then we have... Um, the last verse, which is a statement moving into the next verse. It says, the woman you saw is the great city. We know that's not a city. We discussed that last week in Isaiah 13, 19, and many times before. That rules over the kings of the earth. And this is an identification. You know many times the Lord laces things in there so that you don't get confused on who's who. Okay, it sits there and says, those who worship the beast whose names have not been written in since the beginning of the earth and things like that. It writes those in there so that you can put equal signs and say, that's this, that's this, that's this, that's that. So in reality is that we have here, um, the, where we have right here, these actually all kind of go together. In my, in my little weird way, I draw these things so they flow together. The great deceiver piece right here actually comes down in here. And uh, we talked about it, and, and we'll talk about it uh, probably Tuesday, maybe next Sunday, uh, unless we get to it on, on Tuesday. It says, it, the angel tells the, it says, the people of God are to come out of her. Who? The prostitute. What does that mean? That means that, that they have, even though they are saved, because that's what he calls them, um, his people in that verse, in reality, uh, they are acting and, and conducting themselves like they are part of the great prostitute. They are involved in religiosity, okay? And how does that happen? I put a little word here. Uh, there's another piece here, down in here. It says, what is the goal? And what is the goal of these right here, okay? And uh, you're going to have to look at these verses on your own, but I put it there for you. There's many verses that, are, that help you, but I put labels on them. The goal is to seduce the people, the waters, right? It seduces both unbelievers and believers. How do we know it seduces believers? Right here, Revelation 18.4. Tell my people to come out of her. Out of her is the prostitute. <clears throat> okay, So we know that it seduces. In reality, uh, we, we know this from uh, Romans, where many believers have become the enemy of Christ because they have adopted false doctrine. They are acting. They have allowed it into their churches. Um, pastors allow uh, demonism and false doctrine into their churches by not knowing the Word of God, by not being able to identify this prostitute. So why is a prostitute important? If you don't know her, who she is, she can be sitting next to you and you'll like her. She'll think she's a really nice lady. Okay? Uh, but in reality, by looking at what the Word of God reveals about her, you know in reality she is anti-God. Okay? She is, the, she is the hater of God. So we see that. In reality, she, meaning ecumenical religion, even today, deceives people and will deceive them when that power comes together, the rival of an empire and the beast 
and the ten and the ten kingdoms, and it will lace it together itself with that prostitute, and it will be all powerful. It will actually rule and dominate the entire world, and it will wipe out anybody who stands against us, stands against it, for a short time. Okay, those are the blood of the saints. He says <clears throat> their job is to get them away from God's plan of salvation. Away from his operational will. What is the operational will of God? It is the protocol of God by which a believer knows where they're going. We talked about it up here. It is the part that the purpose of it is to be filling with the Holy Spirit and we allow you to be filled with the truth of God, to be completely operational in God's plan, as we talked about up in here, verse 12, in maturity, and to be carrying that out in the life that God has placed them in. Okay, that's the operational will for God. It is for you to be mature. Um, the other part is the geographical will. It is, it is the, the religion's purpose to seduce people in reality in the geographical will to move them away from where they're supposed to be. Um, and what that means is that if you remember the best example of this is David when he was supposed to be out in the field in the army and what happened is he said, he said no, no, go take care of that. Um, I'll just stay here. You guys got it handled. And what did he do? He ended up on the top of, of his castle, of his palace and down there was a little Bathsheba, a uh, really beautiful Bathsheba and he got into trouble. Why? Because he was, he was outside the geographical will of God. Now, Christians today, we just move all over the place whenever we want to. We just think that that's okay. But we know that there is a geographical will of God, that God requires us to be where we're supposed to be. He puts us in a place because that's where we're supposed to be. Okay? And if we move out of that geographical will without making sure that God himself is the one who moved us, we get into trouble. Okay? Many times, unless you have seen the Macedonian man lately in the book of Acts, in reality, you're where you're supposed to be. Okay? And if you remember, that's when he was going to the northern part of Turkey. And what happened is that the Macedonian man, God gave him a vision and moved him up into Macedonia, into Thessalonica, and into the, the Philippi, and places like that, which was Macedonia. Um, so unless you have the Macedonian man coming to you as a vision, stay where you're at. Don't move from your job. Don't do weird things. Don't be unstable like we talked about up here. Don't be the unstable one. Stay within the operational will of God and the place that God puts you. Okay? Um, the last one here is the mental will of God. And we talked about this. Uh, in 4.14, the one up here, is that there is a thing that God wants you to think. So the question on the mental will of God is that God is saying, what do you want me to think? See, it comes down to where do you want me to be, what do you want me to do, Lord, and what do you want me to think? Well, the thinking part's real easy. He's told us that in verse 14. I want you to think the epinosis of God and to become Christ-like. That's your job. If you're not doing that, you are off task, you are outside the plan of God. So these are very important things. Operational will, geographical will, and the mental ill. Where are you supposed to be? Okay? Now, we just got a few minutes here, but these are the things right here. These are called counterfeit doctrines. How does he do this goal here? What he does is he gives us, the ecumenical church does this by giving counterfeits to God's truth. And what he does, as we've talked about, he maxes them up. So he has a counterfeit gospel, okay? What is the counterfeit gospel? Now, here's the verses, look through them. One of them is, Christianity is being nice. Be a good guy. Be a good father. Be a good husband. Be a good, be, go on and on. Reality is good is not the gospel. If I am good, I cannot get to heaven, okay? I have to be saved. Okay, So you have one hand, Jesus Christ saying, save, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's done. In an ecumenical religion, religion says, the gospel is, you will get to be heaven if you're really good. If you give your tithes and your offering, you show up every Sunday. Now will you do that? Will a Christian do that? He should do that. But does it save him? Absolutely not. Okay. Then we have false ministers, we're familiar with them. There are many ministers... I could name some names, but I get in trouble. But there are many ministers who propagate false doctrine, 
false things. In reality, they come under the guise of Christianity, but in reality, Jesus is not mentioned as the Savior. Okay? In reality, doctrine that is given to them and they give out is false doctrine. We talked about one of those last week. Um, false doctrine, counterfeit doctrine. What is a counterfeit doctrine? It's when you replace one with the other. I'll tell you what, what I want you to do is that you're going to be a good Christian boy and you're going to follow all the Ten Commandments. Okay? Uh, that's a false doctrine for the church because the doctrine for the church is you'll be holy as I am holy. I'm going to give you a grace operation so that you can walk in the Holy Spirit and you can have the truth of the Word of God fully and in that way, in reality, you will walk as Christ walked. Okay? That's the doctrine that we're supposed to follow. There are many false doctrines. False communion table. This is talking about here. There's a communion table that the devil has. Okay? Um, there's a spirituality, a false spirituality. There's a counterfeit spirituality. You see it, people go in the masses and things like that. <coughs> there is a false righteousness. We know about this one. This is the rich man, remember? He said, but I've already done those, those Ten Commandments. But Jesus is very clear in saying, you're not saved. In reality, is that your righteousness is false. Okay? False righteousness. This is the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. What power? The power of the Holy Spirit. The true uh, operational power of, uh, of the Christian life. In re operational life, there is a different operational life. Here we have it right here in Matthew 23. The power of God, the true power of God, not, not another power, not your power. God does not need you, nor your power, nor your goodness, nor your sweetness, nor your kindness. If he needed it, he didn't need to die on the cross. You need it, he's done it all. And as the Christian life is. And he also has false gods. So that wraps it up. The only last piece I have here is I want you to look at, hopefully you can see all of it, is there is a contrast of viewpoints. This is an important thing for us to do. And we'll cover this because we're going this direction, right? This is government mourns in Revelation 18.5. She mourns of the death uh, of that relationship of government and, and religion. Okay? She actually weeps over it. Even though she causes it, the, political power causes it. She weeps over it in this verse. Commerce weeps over it. Um, I was going to start something on commerce today with, uh, with Mother's Day, but I'll leave it for Father's Day because it'll be more fun. Okay? Uh, how the church has bought into commerce and how it follows, it follows the world's view on Christmas and on Easter and on these other holidays. Commerce has become part of normal Christianity, and we can't tell the difference. So commerce mourns, transportation mourn, mourns, in verse 19 of chapter 18. But the divine viewpoint shows up in chapter 19 of Revelation, verses 3 and 4, where there is, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, that the, that the that all ecumenical religion has been wiped out, that her, her uh, followers have been... Uh, extinguished and eaten and died and all that. So, um, that's the wrap up. We should be finished with it. And look these all up. This is your homework assignment. <laughs> okay? uh, you guys always want verses. Here's all the verses right here. We didn't cover them. But you have the doctrine. So see if you can find these in here on your weekly study and match them up. Okay? So that you can confirm what I have told you. So, let's, let's um, close in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you have nailed religion down, that we should be as Christians and as churches throughout the country so vigilant and so easy to identify this falseness, this doctrines that are lies that move Christians to do what is wrong, to actually be part of, of the atrocities of the whore of Babylon. I pray, Lord, to help us to do that, help us to distinguish those by becoming more mature, by taking epinosis doctrine, by uniting the scriptures so that we understand what we're supposed to be doing. We know what our operational will is for you, you have for us, for our geographical will that you have for us, and for the thinking will that you have for us, which is Bible doctrine. The same as that of Jesus Christ, in his name, amen.